Section 4 of Atlantic Narratives, Modern Short Stories, published 1918 by the Atlantic Monthly Press. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Possessing Prudence by Amy Wentworth Stone. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Part 1. A lie is an abomination unto the Lord, a hundred and twenty-four. A lie is an abomination unto the Lord, a hundred and twenty-five. A lie is an abomination unto the Lord, a hundred and twenty-six, recited Prudence Jane, and paused. Go on, said Aunt Annie, looking up from her sewing and fixing her eyes severely on the small blue back across the room. Prudence Jane, with the heels of her little ankle ties together and her hands clasped tightly behind her, was standing in the corner saying what was known in the family as her punish sentence. Whenever she had been unusually naughty, she had to say one four hundred times up in Aunt Annie's room. It was, no doubt, a silly sort of punishment, but it was one that Prudence Jane strongly objected to. And that, after all, is the essence of a punishment. Prudence Jane had seven teasing, mimicking brothers, and whenever one of them caught her saying a punished sentence, it was days before she heard the last of it. Already in the garden below there was audible a shrill voice singing, A lie is an abomination unto the Lord, to the tune of, Has anybody here seen Kelly? And out of the corner of her eye, which was supposed to be fastened on the rosebuds of Aunt Annie's wallpaper, Prudence Jane could see an impudent little person in corduroys straddling the gravel walk and squinting up at the window. Is a lie an abomination in the Bible? inquired Prudence Jane. Yes, said Aunt Annie. Go on. Where? demanded Prudence Jane. Where? repeated Aunt Annie a little blankly. Why... Why, in the middle of the Bible. Don't you listen to the minister, Prudence Jane? The middle of the minister's Bible? pursued Prudence Jane. Yes, of course, said Aunt Annie. Prudence Jane, if you don't go on at once, I shall have you to say it five hundred times. A lie is an abomination unto the Lord, a hundred and twenty-seven, resumed Prudence Jane hastily. Prudence Jane's sentences varied from day to day it being Aunt Annie's idea to fit the sentence to the crime whenever possible. Thus, for being late to school, it was naturally, procrastination is the thief of time. While for telling Lena the cook that Uncle Arthur had said she was more of a lady than Aunt Annie, the sentence had been nothing less than, truth crushed to earth will rise again. This particular fib had been very disastrous in its consequences. We will not dwell upon them here. They make a story in themselves. Suffice it to say that there was no possible excuse for Prudence Jane. It was otherwise with the fib for which she was this morning serving a sentence up in Aunt Annie's room. Those who also have been named after their two grandmothers will at once forgive Prudence Jane for telling the new minister the very first time she met him that her name was Imogen Rose. It was, to be sure, a stupid little fib, and was therefore quite unworthy of Prudence Jane. For Prudence Jane almost never told stupid little fibs. The fibs of Prudence Jane were little masterpieces with a finish and a distinction all their own. Her brother Will, who adored her and had a large mind, declared when he came home from college that she was the greatest mistress of imaginative fiction since George Eliot. Her Aunt Annie, who had not the advantages of a college course, and who roomed with Prudence Jane, said that she was a simple little liar. Now this was unfair of Aunt Annie, for whatever else Prudence Jane might be, she was not simple. Even her looks belied her. With her big, confiding eyes, as round and blue as two forget-me-nots, and her pale yellow hair held demurely back from her forehead by a blue ribbon fillet, she gave an impression of gentle innocence that was altogether misleading. She is so like little Bertie, dear old Grandpa Piper would say, that same frail, flower-like look that he had toward the last. I almost tremble sometimes, 
Haven't you noticed a transparency about her lately, Annie? But Aunt Annie never had. It may be said in passing that there was only one person to whom Prudence Jane was really transparent, and that was her youngest brother, Peter. Peter was a square, solid little person with a vacant countenance, but nothing important that Prudence Jane did escaped him. Just to look into that sweet little face is enough for me, Grandma Goodwin would declare. I don't want anybody to tell me that Prudence Jane is untruthful. No child could look straight at you out of her little soul, as she always does, and tell a fib. The trouble is they don't understand her at home. I've always said Annie Piper has a suspicious nature. To do Aunt Annie justice, it should be said that rooming with Prudence Jane did not tend to cultivate in one a nature that was trustful and confiding. And yet, at heart, Prudence Jane was really not at all the incorrigible little fibber that she seemed. She told fibs, not because she wished to deceive, but because the dull facts of life were so much less interesting than the lively little romances which she could make up out of her own head. When one is a creative genius, one naturally rebels at being shackled to anything so tedious as a fact. Prudence Jane, looking back over a day, could rarely separate the things which had really happened from those she had invented. Her brother Horace, who was studying law, said that he would give a hundred dollars to see Prudence Jane on the witness stand. This was one night at supper when she was being cross-examined by Aunt Annie. For five minutes she had kept the family spellbound by a circumstantial account of how that afternoon she had seen an automobile truck loaded with a thousand boxes of eggs go over the embankment. With eggs at 65 cents a dozen, this was really a very shocking tale. Prudence Jane, said Aunt Annie, who had private sources of information, you know well enough that no truck went over the embankment. Whatever do you mean by telling such an outrageous fib? Prudence Jane looked across the supper table at her aunt out of two round, candid eyes. That wasn't a fib. That was just a story, she explained. Well, it wasn't true, and stories that aren't true are very wicked, said Aunt Annie with decision. Are all the stories in books true? inquired Prudence Jane, the picture of innocence behind her bowl of bread and milk. No, Aunt Annie was forced to admit. But stories written in books are different. The writers don't mean for us to believe them. Do they say so in the books? went on Prudence Jane relentlessly. Of course not, said Aunt Annie. We know their stories aren't true, so they don't deceive us. But you always know my stories aren't true, too, objected Prudence Jane. So I don't deceive you either. Prudence Jane, said Aunt Annie, I shan't argue with you. You are a very naughty little girl. I sometimes think you don't belong to us at all. You're so different from your brothers. This was true. All the other little pipers had been simple, virtuous children with imaginations under perfect control. A remarkable family, everyone had said, until the pipers became quite complacent about themselves. This was why Prudence Jane seemed like such a judgment upon them. They had waited long and patiently, as Aunt Annie put it, for Providence to see fit to send them a dear little girl to inherit their grandmother's names, and they received Prudence Jane. Had she appeared at an earlier date, or had there been another girl in the family, she might have escaped either the Prudence or the Jane. But for fifteen years, little masculine pipers had arrived in the household with unbroken regularity, and been named, one after another, after all the available grandfathers and uncles. For the last one, indeed, there had not been even a cousin left, and he had been christened by common consent, Peter Piper. And still the grandmothers waited. From the moment, therefore, when bluff old Dr. Jones looked in upon the parlor full of ants and announced that it was a girl at last by Jove, there had been no choice left for Prudence Jane. The only point discussed in the solemn family conclave was as to whether she should not be Jane Prudence. Oh, for mercy's sake, call the poor little kit jurisprudence and be done with it, said a flippant uncle, and that had settled it. Prudence Jane was duly entered at the end of the list in the middle of the family Bible, and her career began. <laughs>
Through eight years, she was just unmitigated Prudence Jane. Not a syllable of it could ever be omitted, lest one grandmother or the other be slighted. And then suddenly one day, she decided that it was a combination no longer to be born. She hated her name with all her little soul, therefore she would discard it and take another. This sounded simple, but there were, in fact, several complications. The most important was Aunt Annie. Never a really progressive spirit, in this matter of names, Aunt Annie showed herself to be an out-and-out -out stand patter. You wish that you had been called Gwendolyn, she echoed in horror, as she combed out the pale yellow hair at bedtime. Why, Prudence Jane, I'm ashamed of you. Gwendolyn is a very silly name indeed, and you have two such noble ones. I only hope that you will grow up to be like the beautiful grandmamas who gave them to you which was a truly lovely little bit of optimism on Aunt Annie's part. Part 2 Prudence Jane did not consult Aunt Annie further. That very night, however, staring up into the darkness from her little white bed, she decided upon a new combination, and when the Reverend Mr. Sanders came up to her the next day after Sunday school and inquired kindly what little girl this was, Prudence Jane was quite prepared to tell him, with the transparent look which so frightened dear old Grandma Piper, that it was Imogen Rose. She fully meant to inform her family of this interesting change as soon as she got home from Sunday school, but when she tiptoed into the parlor, Aunt Annie, in all the majesty of her plum-colored satin, was sitting in a straight-backed chair reading The Christian Word and Work, and looked unreceptive to new ideas. So Prudence Jane tiptoed out again to await a more favorable moment. Unfortunately, before that moment arrived, she had a falling out with her brother Peter. This was a mistake, for it was the part of Prudence always to make an ally of Peter Piper. He had discovered Prudence Jane flat on the floor in a corner of the library, scratching her name out of the family Bible with an ink eraser. Did the minister tell you to write Imogen in? he inquired blandly, as he stood in the doorway with his hands in his corduroys. "'None of your business,' retorted Prudence Jane, closing the Bible with a bang and sitting down upon it. The result was that Peter Piper, from whom nothing was ever hidden, went off and told Aunt Annie all about Imogen Rose and the minister. Whereupon Aunt Annie, with her usual limited point of view, had pronounced it a very monstrous fib indeed, and had sent Prudence Jane instantly into the corner. A lies an abomination unto the Lord, 398. A lies an abomination unto the Lord, 399. A lies an abomination unto the Lord, 400, finished Prudence Jane at a canter, and whisked around from her corner. Aunt Annie beckoned with solemn finger. Tomorrow, Prudence Jane, she said, looking across the sewing table, I am going to take you to see the minister, and you must tell him yourself what your real name is, and what a dreadful story you have told him. I shall ask him what he thinks should be done with a little girl who cannot speak the truth. I am sure I don't know what he will say, but we can't deceive a minister. They always know when they hear a fib. Do they? asked Prudence Jane, openly interested, her round eyes fastening upon her aunt. Always, replied Aunt Annie rashly. Then why do I have to go and tell him? asked Prudence Jane. Prudence Jane, said Aunt Annie, you are a very saucy little girl, and I'm sure I don't know what is going to become of you. Prudence Jane walked slowly out of the room. She was considering what Aunt Annie had said about ministers, and she wondered if it were true. As she went tripping down the stairs, she decided to put the Reverend Mr. Sanders to a test the very next time she met him. And that was why it was so surprising when she peeked through the hall window at the foot of the stairs to behold him diligently wiping his feet on the doormat. How do you do, said Prudence Jane politely as she opened the door. Why, good afternoon, Imogen, said the minister, shaking hands cordially. Prudence Jane made a little nix that she had learned at German school. It was always the finishing touch to Prudence Jane. The Reverend Mr. Sanders looked down upon it with a most friendly smile. Is your aunt at home? he asked, placing his hat on the table and following Prudence Jane into the parlor. Yes, she said with simple candor. A fib of that sort was quite beneath Prudence Jane. 
then she sat down on the velvet sofa spread out her little blue skirt folded her hands in her lap and crossed her ankle ties she had never in her life looked so much like little birdie the reverend mr sanders regarding her from an opposite chair waited for her to open her lips and say speak lord for thy servant heareth instead this is what she said is eliza anna abomination your grandmother i beg pardon said reverend mr sanders is she dead and gone to heaven and that's why you say unto the lord continued prudence jane i wonder imogen he said if you would mind beginning over again i say is eliza anna abomination your grandmother repeated prudence jane aunt annie says she's written down in the middle of your bible where all people's relations are and she sounded like a grandmother they always have such horrid names the minister looked across at the velvet sofa with eyes that entirely contradicted the gravity of his face no he said i'm sorry but she isn't i wish she were i never heard of such a jolly grandmother is she an aunt pursued the small interlocutor i'm afraid she's not even related by marriage he replied isn't she written down in the middle of your bible at all said prudence jane the minister shook his head no he said i'm afraid not then aunt annie told a whopper announced prudence jane with satisfaction we should not malign the absent said reverend mr sanders and that being the case suppose you go up at this point imogen and tell your aunt annie that i am here prudence jane wondered what maligning the absent was she distrusted gentlemen who made cryptic remarks of this sort it was the way her brother horace had she saw that the moment had now arrived to test aunt annie's theory about ministers and fibs she can't come down she replied can't come down repeated the minister no said prudence jane looking at him out of the depths of her forget-me-not eyes she's washed her hair oh said the reverend mr saunders in a tone of one who finds the conversation getting definitely beyond him at this moment an apparition with a round face and a pair of corduroy shoulders suddenly darkened the open window Eliza an abomination unto the lord it sang and catching sight of the clerical back vanished hastily interesting chorus observed the reverend mr sanders prudence jane made no heed to this interruption it's hanging down her back now she pursued launching upon the details with her usual aplomb it comes clear down to here and standing up she indicated a point halfway between her ankle ties and the bottom of her ridiculous skirt the minister gazed fascinated prudence jane sat down again she washed it with the packer's tar soap she said her eyes fixed upon her victim she was quite unable to make out whether aunt annie was right about ministers or not the reverend mr sanders looked like a sphinx she gave a piece to a gentleman once went on prudence jane warming to her work he wasn't a very nice gentleman he was a a she hesitated a moment over a fitting climax a a piscopalian she finished mercy said the reverend mr sanders finding his voice at last and what may i ask are you prudence jane looked faintly surprised i she said with a pride and composure i'm an orthodox congo gaysianist yes said the reverend mr sanders so i suspected from the first and now what did he mean by that thought prudence jane to herself she could no longer see his face he had turned abruptly in his chair and was watching something through the aperture in the portieres prudence jane heard the thump of a pair of shoes plodding up the stairs and along the upper hall she knew that it was peter piper going to find aunt annie there was a stir in the room overhead then the muffled sound of a rocking chair suddenly abandoned followed by the swish of skirts coming along the passage and down the stairs prudence jane sat with parted lips on the edge of the sofa
the reverend mr sanders looked decidedly nervous but he rose and presented a bold front to whatever might be coming to him through those portieres in another moment they were pushed hastily aside and aunt annie crowned with a quite faultless coiffure hurried into the room why mr sanders she said i did not know until this minute that you were here then her eye fell upon her niece prudence jane was now standing in front of the sofa tracing the pattern of the carpet with the toe of an ankle tie why didn't you tell me mr sanders was waiting demanded aunt annie sternly prudence jane continued to gaze at the carpet mr sanders said aunt annie who never postponed a disagreeable duty we have a little girl here who cannot speak the truth and we are going to ask you to tell us what becomes of people who tell wrong stories the reverend mr sanders looked ill at ease come here continued aunt annie holding out her hand toward the velvet sofa prudence jane moved reluctantly across the room and now went on the voice of the accuser she has even deceived her minister and she has come to make her little confession tell mr sanders directed aunt annie the truth about that wicked fib which one inquired prudence jane meekly you know very well which answered the exasperated aunt the last one prudence jane lifted her blue eyes from the carpet and looked straight at the unfortunate mr sanders she didn't give any of it to the pescopalian she said then she turned and walked discreetly through the portieres she felt that it was no moment to stay and learn what became of little girls who told whoppers didn't give who what she could hear aunt annie saying vaguely on the other side of the curtains but prudence jane decided to let the minister explain end of story here we include the biographical and interpretive notes by editor charles swain thomas amy wentworth stone is a resident of boston who combines a pleasant sense of the ludicrous with a rare understanding of the spirit of childhood this miniature sketch of amy wentworth stones is admirably handled and sparkles with the best and kindliest humor a humor that is in no sense spoiled by the sins that rest so lightly upon the imaginative soul of little prudence jane her sins hark quickly back to the childhood periods of each reader who sympathetically remembers the world of fancy which conflicted so loudly with dull realism the charm of this humorous tracery will invite the rereading of miss stone's similar triumph in capital punishments published in the atlantic for november 1913 end of section